Good morning, church family. So nice to see all of you again. Uh, this week, I, I saw a pastor friend of mine. Uh, he posted on Facebook, uh, and it was the Ten Commandments rephrased positively. So instead of commandment number one being, you shall have no other gods before me, it was put God above all else. You know, instead of do not commit adultery, it was be faithful to your spouse. Instead of do not bear false witness, uh, it was be truthful. And uh, this post was, was getting lots of likes, lots, lots of hearts, lots of comments. Amen. This is, this is so good. This is, this is so helpful. People saying how much they, they loved this version of the Ten Commandments. But I was torn. Because on, on the one hand, you know, this is, it, was, it was good biblical interpretation. And in fact, historic commentators on the Ten Commandments have long recognized that every negative prohibition has some type of positive duty associated with it. But I wondered, why was everyone loving this post so much? Was it only because it was helpful? The reaction was so positive, I began to wonder, Man, do the people prefer my friend's version of the Ten Commandments over God's? I mean, imagine if Moses posted the Ten Commandments on Facebook. How many likes and comments do you think that would get? How many thumbs up and hearts would Moses' Ten Commandments or the Lord's Ten Commandments get? I mean, would, would you be embarrassed by God's prohibitions? Are we, are we offended that the Lord of all creation tells His creatures no? I submit to you a reason that, are, that people, so many people like the positive version of the Ten Commandments is because we don't like anyone telling us what we can't do, even God. Which proves that we don't want God to be our God. And we don't really understand fully who He is and what He has done for us. And as Jake mentioned, this is one of the foundational issues in the Garden of Eden. God said, do not eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Oh, but it looks pleasing to the eye. It looks like it was real good. Desiring wisdom. She took and ate of that tree. The foundational choice was, will we let God decide for us what is good and evil? Or do we want to be the decision makers ourselves? But when we eat of that tree, when we decide to be the determiners of good and evil, it leads to death. It leads to death. But God's commands are for our good. They lead to life. They lead to our flourishing. And as we continue our sermon series, if you're joining us this morning, we're in a sermon series called The Ten Commandments Today, how ancient laws lead to a flourishing life. And we're looking at the first commandment. The first commandment is foundational to the other nine. We have to put first things first. The first commandment comes first because it's the most important. Why is it the most important? Because no thing, no person, nothing in your life, nothing in all creation should be more important to you than God. When you know that, when you live that, you will flourish. So how do we understand and apply this first commandment? Well, first of all, let's, let's look at what the commandment says. Deuteronomy 5. Now it begins, the whole commandment begin with this preface, which I think is the key to understanding especially the first commandment says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So let's unpack this. Uh, we're going to look at the first phrase, I am the Lord. And my, the point I want to make about this is, is, number one, what it teaches here is that we believe and confess that the Lord is the one true God. Now, before we get to the prohibition of other gods, there is first a statement of God's identity and our relationship to him. And uh, if you were in confirmation class with Jessica Johnson and I last week, you would have learned something very important about how to read the word LORD in all caps in your English Bible. It is not just the generic word LORD, Adonai, when it, you, you'll see that in your English Bible when it's not capitalized. But when it's capitalized, it's actually referring to God's special name, his covenant name, often pronounced Yahweh. We see this in Exodus chapter 3. Let's look at that, what it says. Moses said, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, Well, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. 
God reveals His essential name, His who He is. I am who I am, or it could be translated, I will be who I will be. This is saying that God is the great eternal God who always was, who always is, who always will be. He has life in His very self. He's the great I am. He is the life-giving power behind this entire universe. This is God's special covenant name that He revealed to His people. So the Ten Commandments begin with God stating His identity. This is who He is. And this tells us that God wants to be known. He wants you to know who He is, what He's like, His character, His very special name. And then we are, and when we are told that you shall have no other gods, what that positively means is that we are to take this God, this specific God, the real true God, to be our God. We are saying that the one and only, the great creator, the eternal sustainer and source of all things is our God. We are claiming that this God who has revealed himself to us is our God. Now, when the people were in Egypt, Egypt had about, scholars say, about about 2,000 different gods. The nations around them worshipped many different gods. And so really, left to our own devices, humanity left to our own devices, we don't come to know God by our own reason. We come up with all kinds of other ideas and thoughts. But God revealed himself to the people, who he was. It says this in Deuteronomy 4. This is right before we get the Ten Commandments, De- Deuteronomy. It says, you were shown these things so that you might know the Lord is God. Besides him, there is no other. Acknowledge and take the to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. So the first commandment means to admit, believe, and confess that God is the one and only, the true God of heaven and earth, and there is no other. God's personal identity, his character, his name, he has a a history with the people. And what's interesting to me was that the ancient people Although they believed in many, many other gods, what they, what they never did was to say, well, really all of these gods that we worship are really just different names for the one true God. No ancient person ever did that or said that. But this, this, this can happen when, even if we, just say, if we just believe in monotheism. Even that can be warped by Satan. To say that really all of these different gods out there, they're really just different ways of describing the one God that is. But this is a warped denial of the first commandment. Now, I I believe that because we're all made in the image of God, uh, we all can grasp certain natural truths about creation. You know, Romans 1, we can see God's eternal qualities from all that has been made. And we look at the many different religions out there and we realize that they all share many similarities which must be celebrated. But I think it's, we do a disservice and a disrespect to other people when we say that all of this diversity that's out there is actually the same thing. It's actually not honoring of other people and other cultures and other belief systems. And it's not honoring to God's very identity who says he wants to be known. And it's even more important that this God has revealed himself in and through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Paul said, God wants everyone to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth of who God is, right? The Bible also says there's one name under heaven by which we, we must be saved. It's Jesus Christ. And God does, is, not, is not willing to overlook our, our ignorance or maybe our willful decision to leave his true identity vague or unnamed. He's not willing to share his glory with any other name, any other God, or any other system. God has an identity, a history, a character, a name that communicates who he is. And he's the one who's chosen to reveal himself this way, right? So to reject this revelation is to reject God who has revealed himself. Martin Luther put it this way. I have this up on the screen for you. He said, this command is like God saying, you shall have me alone as your God. And the fundamental question is, who is this me? Who is this God that is revealing himself and calling us to this? And this is where I believe the creed, the Apostles' Creed, is connected to the Ten Commandments. Who are we believing? Who are we worshiping? Who are we giving our allegiance to? To God, 
the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and to Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He is now seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. That is the God that I believe in and I worship, and we give our allegiance to. Amen. We believe in the God of the Bible, the God of Jesus Christ, the God who is three in one. Who are we praying to? Who are we worshiping? It's not simply a spirit, not simply a force, not simply a universal moral principle or philosophy. We worship the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth, who has revealed himself through Israel and Jesus Christ. We are worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, Saul, David, Solomon, Ruth, Deborah, Esther, the God and Father of Lord Jesus Christ, the God of the Apostle Paul, Peter, and James, the God of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the God I worship. If we disregard this identity of God that we, that, who has revealed himself to us, we are denying his essential being. So to sum it up, we talked about catechisms last week, and there's, there's a helpful question and answer in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is required in the first commandment? It requires us to know and acknowledge God to be the only true God and our God and to worship and glorify Him accordingly. And then it's asked, well, what is forbidden in the first commandment? The first commandment forbids the denying or not worshiping and glorifying the true God as God and our God and the giving of that worship and the glory to any other which is due to Him alone. So this is the first essential to the first commandment. We believe and confess that the Lord is the one true God. The second thing that we need to understand about this is we make the Lord our God by fearing, loving, and trusting Him above all things. Your God. I am the Lord your God. What does it mean to make something your God or someone your God? And again, Martin Luther is very helpful on this. In the Shorter Catechism, he says, this means that we should fear, love, and trust God above all things. Now, as you meditate on that, you'll find out that's a very demanding statement. But I think Luther is very much right. Because what you fear above all things becomes your God. What you love above all things is your God. What you trust above other things is your God. So I ask you, is the Lord Jesus Christ your God? Do we fear Him above all things? We must have this holy fear towards God. God, you know, God is not ashamed both to warn us of judgment, to call us to fear Him, and to express His undying love for us. The Bible does not see these as opposed to one another. I think God has a more complex identity than we often allow Him to have. The proper fear of God is not at all opposed to us loving God or God loving us. And in fact, it's God's love for us that warns us of wayward living and departing from Him. Fearing God is not being afraid of Him. It means properly giving Him awe and reverence, and taking seriously His warnings, His judgments, His commands. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Because when you fear Him above all things, you will live wisely, justly, and rightly. It leads to a flourishing life. I think a good test question on this is, I, th I think about who am I more afraid of displeasing right now? in my life. Who am I afraid of displeasing? What we fear often shows what we value. Do you fear displeasing others, perhaps more than displeasing God? What are you valuing? Do you fear displeasing your employer? What are you valuing, valuing there? Do you fear displeasing your family? What are you val valuing? Are you worried about money in your possessions? What are you valuing? We are to fear and revere God above all things. Is the Lord Jesus Christ your God? To make the Lord our God, we also need to love Him above all things. As Jesus said, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Do we love Him more than the things of this earth? More than other people? More than our friends? More than our very own family? Jesus talked about that. The first commandment is, honestly, I think the most demanding. 
It's the most demanding. God wants us to love Him and cherish Him above all things. And finally, your God is what you trust in above all things. Again, Luther is helpful here. He says, we are to trust in God alone and look to Him and expect from Him nothing but good. As from one who gives us body, life, food, drink, nourishment, health, protection, peace, and all necessaries of both temporal and eternal things. He also preserves us from misfortune. And if any evil befalls us, he delivers us and rescues us. So it is God alone from whom we receive all good and by whom we are delivered from all evil. Luther is referencing the biblical principle that all the good we have in life, anything good that you have, any blessing that you have, its ultimate source is in God alone. He is the source of all good things in this universe. In all the evil and suffering we experience, we expect Him to comfort, to strengthen, and to bring some type of deliverance to us, whether that be in this life or in the next. Friend, you know, if you've walked with Jesus for a while, sometimes it's, it's not easy to trust in God above all things. Lots of evil does befall us in this life. As Philip Yancey titled the book, Where is God When It Hurts? And when evil does happen to us, and you know that it will, who or what do we run to? Devices or vices? Away from God or towards God in lament? We ought to trust in Him. Even as you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil. The evil will come, but His rod and His staff comfort. And we trust that no matter how bad the valley of death is looking right now, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The only way through the valley of death is to trust the good shepherd, that he still knows, that he cares, that he still loves you, that he's still at work redeeming all things no matter what. So I encourage you, don't look to other things to redeem you or save you. Those are false dead ends. Not, nothing can save or redeem except God alone. To make something our God, to make the Lord of all creation our God, we must fear, love, and trust Him above all things. And then finally on our first commandment, because He has saved us, we give our exclusive allegiance to God. Again, we're still in the preface here. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now, before giving the prohibition that many people seem to not like, God reminds them again of how he has saved them and delivered them. Keeping the first commandment entails that we, we remember all that God has done to save us. We're always to remember that we live as already saved and redeemed people. And thereby, our response to His commands is out of gratitude and love and obedience to this God. For the Old Covenant saints, this was to always remember the Exodus. Never forget what God did for you in Egypt. And for New Covenant saints, this is always to remember. We, each one of you, is to always remember Jesus Christ. His life, His death, His resurrection, His ascension, the sending of His Spirit. We are to always remember the cross. We do this by coming to worship every Sunday. We keep the cross central, perhaps in our sanctuary. Perhaps we might wear a cross. Perhaps you might make the sign of the cross, as Christians have done for centuries. We're to always remember we're saved by the cross and the resurrection. I think perhaps this is why for many Christian denominations, too, they have a weekly celebration of communion because it's a reenactment of our salvation, of the life, death, resurrection, and coming again of Jesus Christ. We're always to live remembering the cross. That's the secret to keeping the first command. We want for Him to be our God because He has saved us and He has loved us. And after that, that's when God says, you shall have no other gods before me. This command is about God demanding exclusive loyalty to Himself. God is first and there's not even a close second. In fact, that was the greatest people's temptation and ours as well was to worship the Lord, Yahweh, and Baal, 
and Asherah and all the other gods around them. And it's the same today. Our temptation is not to abandon Jesus Christ, but to worship Jesus and something, something else. Whether that be God or money, family, career, it could be any number of things. And we'll talk more about that next week when we talk about having no idols. But this is a call for exclusive allegiance. And last week I mentioned how the, the Ten Commandments are kind of like a, a covenant vow. And we talked about marital vow, vows last week. And imagine, you know, if, uh, you know I'm giving a wedding and, and I say to, the, say to the husband, you shall have no other woman before your wife. As long as she is first, it's all right to have a few other women on the side. That's not what this commandment's saying. As long as, we, as long as we prioritize God above other things, then it's fine. No, 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 no. God forbid. God wants total allegiance. You shall have no other gods before me. It really means you shall have no other gods at all. The phrase before me is tricky to, is tricky to translate, but it can mean in my presence, uh, uh, in my, uh, in, against my face, or like me, we might say in our culture, right to my face as an act that's seriously offensive. Have no other gods before me in my presence. And of course, we always have God's presence with us everywhere I go. Now, of course, we have other things, other relationships in our lives. Uh, and if we're going to obey the rest of the commandments, we will need those. But nothing and no one must ever come close to being a God to us. Something we fear more than God, something we love more than God, something we trust in more than God. It shouldn't even be a competition. God alone is our God. And God has the right to ask us of this because He is the one true God. He is our maker. He also has saved us and He loves us. So we're to give our exclusive allegiance to Him. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. What does that mean for us today? Well, first it means that we believe and confess that the Lord, the God of the Bible, is the one true God. We make the Lord our God by fearing Him, by loving Him and trusting Him above everything else. And because He has saved us, we give our exclusive allegiance to Him. To make God our God, we must come under His authority, allow Him to tell us the good ways to walk in, and allow Him to say no to the bad ways to not walk in. I would submit to you that the Ten Commandments don't all need to be rephrased positively, although they contain positive ideas. It is good for us, it is good for your soul, I think, to be told no and to accept it. Now, my son, Levi, is two years old, and he can understand some basic prohibitions. Uh, His obedience, because he's two, is sometimes there, sometimes not. Uh, and one of the ways that I try to teach him, and, and I think this is critical to the process, is after he's been disciplined, I have a moment where uh, I get down on his level, and I look him in the eyes, and I repeat the prohibition. I say, Levi, do not throw your things. Breaking all of our stuff. And sometimes he's ready to hear the prohibition. Sometimes he's not. When he's not, He's, he kind of wiggles. He's kind of rambunctious. He's kind of looking his eyes, at it, darting his eyes from anywhere but mine. But then I, I look at him again. Levi, don't throw your things. And I want you to say, okay, Daddy. And it's only when he's ready to look me in the eyes and, he'll sit and say, okay, Daddy. It's amazing how everything changes. His demeanor has changed. He, he stopped wiggling, he stopped fighting it, he stopped, he stopped being rambunctious, and I know now he's ready to go back out, back out into the house, and be a life-giving presence, not a destructive presence. <laughs> Friends, in the same way, we need to come under our, our Father's authority. What happened, what happened to Levi, the change in, in him, what happened to him? He came under his father's authority. He submitted to his father's authority. And when God commands us to do or to not do some type of act, even if it's a do not, the best thing for your soul and for your life is to simply say, okay, Lord, I'm going to look the Lord in the eye. Okay. Okay, Lord, I will obey. I will have no other gods before you. 
come under your Father's authority. Come under the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do that, when you make the Lord your God, you will have more peace. You will have more life. You will have more joy because you've come under the authority of one who cares for you more than you can even imagine. He wants your good. Come under the Father's authority today.